Okay, great. Well, um, welcome to today's presentation. My name is Seth Corbin. I'm an enrollment advisor here at Cambridge Advanced Online. Today, we're gonna to be running an information session on our creativity, problem solving, and design thinking course. Before we get started, I just have a few housekeeping and agenda items that I wanna cover. Everybody has joined on uh, listen only mode today, um, but there are there is, I should say, an opportunity to submit your text questions in the Q&A panel that's located below on this window. And you can submit your questions at any time and we will go ahead and collect those and answer those in our Q&A session later on. If you have any technical issues, you can also submit those questions to the Q&A panel and one of our team members will be reaching out to help you. Um, in the unlikely event that we experience any issues, we'll go ahead and send out a message and restart the webinar. Today's presentation should be about 30 minutes. Um, and then we're also gonna be sending out a survey at the end of the course today. We would appreciate anyone's feedback. And that also gives you another opportunity to ask any questions um, that came up during today's presentation. So for today's agenda, what we're gonna be covering is a little bit about Cambridge Advanced Online, who we are and what we do. Then we're gonna talk a little bit about the online experience, how our courses are designed. Then we're gonna talk about the background of our course lead, Nathan Crilly, and the content of the course. Then we're gonna talk about what are some of the outcomes that students should expect to gain from taking this course. Then we're gonna talk about the support that's offered to the student throughout the entire journey. Then we're gonna jump into our Q&A session. So um, to further ado, I'd like to introduce our panel. Um, again, my name is Seth Corbin. I'm an enrollment advisor. Hi, um, my name is Nathan Crilly. I'm the academic course lead. I'm professor of design in the engineering department here at the University of Cambridge. Hi, my name is Emily Tanner Patterson, and I'm a learning designer at Cambridge Advanced Online. Thank you, panel. Um, so a little bit about Cambridge Advanced Online. Um, Cambridge Advanced Online is designed and created for the professional learner. Our courses are flexible and allow the learner to work around their schedule, whether that's mornings, nights, or weekends. We've also built in interactive sessions to allow for direct contact with our course leads and course tutors. Very similar to today's presentation, you'll actually get to connect with Professor Nathan Crilly in a live session to discuss and cover the content in more depth. Our courses are also designed to have hands-on projects to allow our students to work on practical experiences that they can then turn around and use on the job right away or add it to their portfolio. We've kept the student's success in top of mind as we do have tons of resources to support the learner. This is something I'll cover a little bit later today. Um, but in keeping in mind the flexibility, we do offer quarterly start dates as well. So the learner can really choose what's best for their schedule. We do have some upcoming dates of April 4th and June 13th. Another great thing about the course is it does come directly from Cambridge University. Upon completion of this uh, course, you earn a certificate of achievement directly from the university uh, um, and it's signed by the vice chancellor. This is something that you can definitely post on your resume, your cover letter, or any of your social uh, media uh, accounts that you wish. Um, now I'm gonna go ahead and hand this over to Emily to talk a little bit more about the student experience. Thanks so much, Seth. Um, I think first, uh, we'd love to hear from Nathan about the course and the course specifics and why Nathan came to us to create this course. Nathan, can you take it away and talk about the course? Yeah, sure. Thanks a lot. Hi, everyone. So as I said at the beginning, my name is Nathan Crilly. I'm professor of design here in the engineering department, and I've been here for about 20 years or so. I did my PhD uh, here in Cambridge, and I've uh, been here since then. So my research background is primarily that I research design creativity. So that might be experiments on how students uh, perform problem solving tasks. It might be expert interviews with professional designers, or it might be studies with entrepreneurs who are setting up companies. And in all of this work, I'm uh, often interested in the tension between how do uh, creative people persist with the idea that they need to develop, but also how do they remain flexible so that they can change ideas when that's required. Um, in terms of the motivation for creating the course, uh, it was really based on the observation that over the last, let's say, decade or so, there's been an increasing recognition of the importance of creativity across a wide range of workplaces. So not just in the creative industries or in the design professions, but almost in any sphere of professional work, creativity is now recognized as a key skill, including in leadership. 
So we thought we could develop this course, we could make those skills more accessible to people outside of, for example, design education or um, psychology, where you might study creativity. Um, and therefore the course, if you're asking, is this course for you? It's very broad in terms of who it would relate to. Anyone who's trying to undertake um, projects that would initiate change, anyone trying to identify and resolve problems, then the course has been developed with you in mind. I'll run quickly through the six modules that we have for the course. So in the first module, we look at um, creativity itself, so as a subject, and we look at the different factors that make it up. So we try and break it down into its constituent parts. We look at what motivates creative behavior and also what inhibits it. In the second module, we look at three different thinking approaches that are widely uh, recognized and respected for their ability to drive creative work. So we look at visual thinking, being able to uh, visualize your ideas and share them with other people, but also being able to elicit ideas from other people in a visual form. We also look at systems thinking, so not just focusing on a particular component of something at any given moment, but looking at the wider system it's embedded inside, thinking more holistically, but also looking at the components it's made up of and how they uh, behave over time. And then we look at design thinking, which many of you will have heard of. So when we look at design thinking, we're often focusing on the different stakeholders, for example, users of the product or service or system we're developing and we try to gain empathy for them and we try to prototype very early and often so that we can move from um, not just thinking about our ideas but doing as much um, early implementation as we can so we can get feedback from the world about how effective those ideas are. Then we move on to the first of our three-stage creative process. We look at problem definition, and that includes problem framing and reframing, uh, trying to get a better understanding of what the problem really is without imposing too many assumptions on that. Then we move into idea generation, so widely exploring uh, the different options that are available that will address the problem that we've defined. And then we move on to solution development, so we've got a wide range of options we've already explored, but how do we narrow those down and how do we develop them further? And then we look at uh, creativity in context. So if we have uh, people working in organizational environments, then of course you might have creative individuals, but they get uh, gathered together into creative teams. They might have leaders managing that creative work. And all of that takes place within some sort of creative culture. So we look at how what we've learned in the preceding five modules relates to those sorts of uh, creative uh, contexts, if you like. So now I'll um, talk more about the practical and professional outcomes of taking the course. So I'll talk about three aspects in particular. So first of all, one of the things that learners from the course are able to do is not just refer to creativity in a broad, abstract, uh, sort of general sense, but talk more about the different components it's made up of, talk about the different thinking skills you can use in creative work, and also the different uh, thinking or cognitive biases that can impede creativity. You can also um, uh, think about the different tools and processes that you would use in, in that sort of creative activity. The second uh, outcome to think about is the way in which the learners from the course are able to really apply the creative processes and tools uh, in their own work. So uh, the learners we have typically are busy professionals. They need to immediately be able to apply the learning from the course. And so all the way through the course, we're looking at uh, examples that students are or learners are working on, how they can take the tools that we've just discussed and uh, taken apart in the course, apply them immediately to the example problems we're giving, but also throughout the whole course, working on a, a sort of long form project that each student undertakes individually, so they can be applying this work um, immediately to the contexts that are interesting to them and learn more about the tools by applying them in those contexts. And then finally, um, the ability that learners have at the end of the course, not just to be creative, but also to uh, be able to represent the, those creative skills. So you might have to represent your skills on uh, bios, for example, on LinkedIn. It might be in CVs or interviews. So how can you represent your creative abilities? How can you develop your creative confidence further? Um, and also when you're working with other people, how can you identify creative skills in those that you might be recruiting or working with? And how can you, um, how can you emphasize those or encourage them further? So those are the three main uh, practical and professional outcomes from the course. And I'll now hand over to Emily, who is the learning designer that I worked with in developing the course. Hi, I'm Emily Tanner-Patterson. So what a learning designer does is we take 
all the information that you might uh, associate with a face-to-face -face teaching situation, and we help adapt it into an asynchronous or online format. So what's special about Cambridge Advance Online and our courses is that you're not just getting as you would with some courses, the textbook broken into some web pages, maybe with a couple of videos spliced in. You're not getting endless streams of videos that you have to watch and then try to regurgitate at the end. We lean heavily on what is called the active learning model, which means every time we give you a piece of information, we're gonna to ask to you to put that information into action. What that's going to lead to is that you walk away with actionable skills that you've practiced and then you've gotten feedback on. And you're getting feedback from Cambridge professors and Cambridge Advanced Online tutors who also come from the University of Cambridge. So you know you're getting world-class information and world-class feedback that leads to a set of actionable skills. Um, we Most of the course is delivered through uh, what you see on the screen, which is our virtual learning environment, Canvas. You've probably heard of it if you've done anything with online education. Um, we have heavily adapted Canvas to ensure that it works very well with our active learning model. We also lean heavily on social connections, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. Within Canvas, we have some integrations with some fabulous tools. One is called Miro. It's an online whiteboard tool. We're the only people in the world that have integrated Miro with Canvas. So you know you're getting something special with us. We also have a really cool social annotation tool called Hypothesis, which allows you to do um, almost like a group reading exercise, but in an asynchronous manner. We know that you're busy, that you're a working professional trying to fit this course into your day. And so most of the material is available for you to access at any time for you to work on when it works for you. And then we also have that weekly live session with Professor Curley, where you get to interact with the University of Cambridge professor, even though you're anywhere in the world. And if you happen to be busy that week, if you happen to be in a different time zone, we also ensure that we record the live session just in case you can't make it. You can watch back if you just want to see what Professor Curley had to say about something. Um, or if you're not able to attend, it's there as your resource. We recognize that a lot of learning happens from the other people in the room that you're studying with. So again, even though the course is largely asynchronous, it's also very social. We utilize discussion boards as well as these interactive tools such as Miro and Hypothesis and a few other um, interactive types of group activities to ensure that you're benefiting from the other students in your cohort. So you're very much not in a silo. You're very much not uh, being expected to do everything by yourself. There's lots of support. There's lots of interactivity. Um, our support comes in the form of a tutor, again, hired and vetted by Cambridge Advance Online. Uh, we have a maximum of 30 learners per tutor, but typically cohorts are smaller than that. That way, you know that you're getting a lot of um, interactivity with your tutor. Uh, that tutor is getting to know you, your unique problem set. They're there to help you and to to lead you to further help if you need any kind of help from the Cambridge Advance Online tech team, or if you just need learning support from your tutor, that's what that person is there for. They're not just a, a voice in the void assigning you a grade. They're there to support your learning. And again, the tutor is also there to moderate, to ensure that everybody's behaving themselves, conducting themselves in a professional manner. You don't have to worry that when you walk into a discussion board that uh, it's kind of field day for anyone to, to uh, feedback in any particular way. Uh, we ensure that um, all of the activities that take place within Canvas are well moderated, well regulated, and that that way you're really having that positive social experience with people from all over the world who are here to learn in the same way that you are. And Seth, I think it's back over to you to talk to people about how they can sign up with us. Awesome. Thank you, Emily. Um, we uh, have one thing I just want to build on what Emily was talking about is a little bit about the full cycle of the journey. So Emily did a great job talking about our academic support while you're actually in the course itself. But before you even get started, we have a team of enrollment advisors that will help understand what your career goals are, what's your background, and really making sure that our courses are a great fit for you and, and really making sure that you feel supported, um, giving you your resources like brochures that you need, um, and answering any questions that you may have around course flexibility. Um, and then we also on the back end have a full uh, technical support team that will help you with any technical issues that may come up throughout the process if it's um, you're having trouble logging in or you're not sure how to do something within the Canvas platform. We have a whole dedicated IT team um, to make sure that you feel fully supported throughout the entire process with our course. Um, as far as next steps, um, 
as far as next steps, we can go ahead and schedule um, an appointment. If, if you do have some more questions, um, you can use the link right below um, and we can schedule a call. Usually calls are about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, you know, we can work together and, and make sure that this program is, is going to be a great fit. Um, we can also, uh, you, I should say the student should, um, can also send over an email at advancedonlinesales at cambridge.org. If you are ready to go ahead and take those next steps, it's very simple. You could just go right online and enroll. It takes about 10 minutes to do so. Um, or if your company does require um, an invoice or you want to pay via bank wire, please reach out to one of our enrollment advisors and we'll definitely make sure that you have the right uh, steps that are necessary. It just takes a little bit more time, um, but we can make sure you feel supported in there. Um, so without further ado, we're gonna go ahead and um, take it into our question and answer session. So let me go ahead and get the questions open here. Um, so the first question that we have um, that came in and, and, and maybe Nathan, this is a good one for you, but what level of experience do I need for this course? Yeah, that's a great question. So as I said, it's very broad in terms of the uh, target learner that this would be suitable to. And so we don't require any specific qualifications in a particular subject. Um, maybe to give you a sense on the, on the cohort that we've just finished, so the first course run, then we had people ranging from backgrounds, um, maybe transitioning out of the military, people working in startup companies, people working in university sector, private sector. So very broad ranging in terms of company size um, or organization size and the different sectors they're in and the different backgrounds they came from. So there's no specific um, academic or professional experience that's required. Um, any interest in doing creative work, solving problems, uh, identifying opportunities, all of those would be um, totally relevant to the course. Yeah. Awesome. Great. And actually a good follow-up question to that um, came in. It said, would this be easy to apply what I've learned immediately into my current role? So kind of around that same theme of um, experience and, and using it on the job. Yeah, that's another great question. So the way that the course is structured is that in those six modules, there are activities that you're undertaking in each module. Some of those you undertake by yourself, some of them you do with your uh, cohort that you're learning with. And those are simulations of the kind of work you might do you know, once you've left and gone back to the workplace at the end of the course. And that those examples range across um, sort of range across things like environmental problems, social problems, business problems, you know, a wide uh, variety of problem kinds. And the learners at attack those problems in different ways. They generate solutions for them. But then, of course, like I said, they're also working on their long form project. Uh, so in terms of application, the course is structured so that you're more or less applying it all the way through. It's not that you're going to get six weeks of lecturing and then be left to your own devices as to how you apply it. It's going to be much more like learning a concept, seeing what, how a tool would work, then applying that straight away, and then building on that in the next step to take it further. So the application is available um, from the first week rather than just being at the end of the course. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and Emily, we have a good question that came in here that talks a little bit around uh, people joining from different time zones. Um, could we cover a little bit about how the course is flexible? Yeah, so that, as I mentioned when I was speaking earlier, most of the course is in Canvas. So a lot of the activities you undertake are available 24 7, literally. You could get up at 2 a.m. if you're like me and you have small children, you might be up anyway at 2 a.m. Um, and let's say you're thoroughly awake and you decide you're going to go do some homework in between uh in between um nighttime wakings uh you could do that um the only thing that we ask learners to even consider being live for is this weekly live session and that is one hour um, we typically put it towards the end of the week so thursday is the very common day um, across all of our courses it's later in the day to accommodate people across different time zones and again we know that this is a big globe um, we if we have a small enough cohort we might even move the live session to meet time zone needs and that live session is recorded so if it's in the middle of your night we don't expect you to be up for it um we have it available within canvas the minute it's over the tutor posts the recording in canvas and whether you just want to go back and watch it and catch that point that professor curly made that that went past a little bit quickly or whether you had an, an essential meeting you just couldn't make the live session it's not mandatory it's not counted against you but that recording is there as a resource for you Awesome. Thank you, Emily. Um, and we did have a, a question just come in asking around course fees. 
Um, so the total cost of this course is 1,800 pounds. Um, so that is a one-time payment. We do require payment to be upfront. Um, but we do have quarterly start dates. So a lot of students are waiting for times that work best for them. If they have to go through employer um, you know, checkpoints, they can go ahead and, and make sure that they have the right course. Again, those dates are gonna be April 4th and June 13th. So thank you for that question. Um, I do have a couple of questions around design thinking as well. So Nathan, maybe you could explain how this course covers design thinking um, a little bit more in depth. Yeah, um, so there's a couple of questions on design thinking. I'll try and cover both of those in one answer. So in terms of what design thinking is, there's, there's two different answers to that question. So one answer is the academic answer, that there are people who study the thinking practices of professional designers. They look at the way designers work uh, in, their, in their professional roles, how they approach problems, how they structure them, how they restructure and reframe those problems, how they develop ideas for solutions, how they iterate and prototype on those, and especially how they try to understand the diverse stakeholders who are uh, relevant to the problem and solution that they are engaged with. That's the academic perspective. Related to that is the maybe professional perspective, which is that if you took professional designers and asked them to work on something that's not normally associated with the work that designers do, let's say you ask them to develop a corporate strategy or to look at the way in which um, you can help students move through an educational program. Designers might look at that quite differently to how other professionals would. And sometimes that's called design thinking, if you were to approach it the way a designer would. And a designer might approach it by, as I just indicated, identifying who the main stakeholders are, trying to empathize with them and understand their real needs, visualize the overall problem and the potential for solutions. They might try to prototype the solutions really early, so implement something in a provisional way, get some feedback from that and see how effective it was, um, and then take that further. So those are the two answers to what design thinking is. It's either the study of how designers think, or it's the general application of uh, a designer's approach to undertaking creative work. The, in terms of how, the, how it deals within the course, as you might have noticed from those two explanations, those two things don't sound very different to a creative problem solving process. So there's definitely a lot of overlap between creative problem solving, design thinking, systems thinking, uh, and so on. So the course has creativity, problem solving, and design thinking in the title, not because that's a list of three mutually exclusive approaches or topics, but because really those three things overlap so heavily that um, it can be worth considering them all as one uh, approach. So that's my answer to those two questions. Yeah, thanks, Bob. Thank you, Nathan. Um, we have a, a good question here. Maybe Emily or Nathan, if you want to jump in on this. Um, how is the work assessed? How are students graded throughout the course? Are there projects? Could we cover more in depth for that? Yeah, I can speak a little bit to this. And if I if I miss anything, Nathan, just hop in. Um, so there's a 70% pass mark to get your certificate. So that's that's pretty standard, I think, in, in the online world. Um, and there are two components to that. Part of that is your participation. It, in other words, that you're actually actually taking part in these various activities. Um, as you can imagine, discussion boards don't work if nobody comments. And so um, we encourage you to comment not only through the tutors, but also because a few of the discussion boards are marked as complete or incomplete. Either you did it or you didn't. Um, so some of the course elements are very simple to pass. You just do the activities and, and you get your points. Um, the other part of the course assessment is the long project that Nathan mentioned, which is broken into uh, six pieces because we have six modules. And so in each module, um, you turn in a write-up or a summary of, um, of how you're applying some of the creative tools that we're giving you to a particular problem or problem context, as we call it in the course, meaning that we actually ask you to do some of the things that we're teaching you about in a real-world application and write up some documentation surrounding that, that the tutor will then give you a mark for, but also give you feedback on. And we know from pedagogical learning that feedback is where a lot of learning takes place and is consolidated. So that tutor feedback bit is a huge part of the course. Um, each of those problem submissions um, or project submissions, excuse me, is 10% of the grade. So 60% of the overall pass mark comes from these end of week assignments. The other 40% comes from these complete incomplete activities. Um, Nathan, did I miss anything? I think I got it all. No, that sounds perfect. Yeah, thanks. Awesome. 
Um, and then I did have two questions just come in um, around the certificate of achievement. I can definitely go ahead and answer this. Um, so upon completion of the course, you earn a certificate of, of, of achievement directly from Cambridge Advanced Online. It's signed by the vice chancellor um, at the university. Um, so yes, it is in full collaboration with the university. Um, so I hope that answers that question. Um, and Nathan, it looks like there's another question for you here. Um, would the course be useful for someone who has already studied architect at a master's level? Yeah, I'll answer that one. I'll also try and address the question from Hanan, uh, who says, I'm a university English teacher. To what extent would the course be useful for me? So talking maybe about architecture first of all. So it would certainly be relevant. We had uh, a couple of design professionals on the first course run, um, and they certainly got a lot out of it with all sorts of things they were planning to apply in their professional practice. A lot of design education, focuses, like architecture, focuses very much on the design discipline that you're involved with. So whether that's buildings or spaces in architecture, or whether it's things like furniture um, and other objects in product design. And the, just like in design thinking, where we generalize those approaches and say, well, how would you, how would you construct an intervention in an in a environmental pollution problem, or if you're trying to construct a modification for how a business runs? So you could apply a lot of the creativity that you've already developed in uh, an architecture program, but apply that to problems that aren't uh, necessarily so restricted just to the physical or built environment. So that'd be one approach to thinking about how the course would be relevant. So many people from design disciplines work much more generally, including architects, working not just on the design uh, of those built environment uh, spaces, but also on other uh, creative projects. And so the course is a good way of stepping back from the discipline specific nature of architecture to look more generally uh, at how you would undertake creative work. In terms of uh, university English teacher, uh, so to what extent is the course useful for me? I'll answer in perhaps two different ways. So one is at the administrative level. So if you're operating in a university, just like I do, then there's all sorts of things you're involved with other than teaching. So there's designing the course, there's all sorts of administrative improvements, new initiatives, etc. So there's creative work in how you engage in the organization. And the course is very well suited to that kind of work. In terms of the actual subject matter that you teach, I'm not quite sure what that would be, whether it's English language or English literature, but there's certainly parts of the course that would inform, like how would you take a student through the creative process for their essay? How would you encourage them to think more widely? How could they modify their existing ideas uh, to generate new ones? So those are the, hopefully that covers the, the different options for how I would answer the question. Okay, but thanks for the questions, both of you. I also want to jump on the end of that just a little bit. Thanks, Nathan, um, and say that part of what we try to accomplish with this course is to give you a set of skills um, that will change how you think about challenges and problems. And those skills are very global in nature. Um, they are not tied down to any one specific discipline, um, and they can be applied throughout life, whether that's challenges within your household, challenges within your workplace, or challenges within the uh, football club you um, you play with on the weekend, um, or, or soccer, depending on which side of the Atlantic that you're on. Um, and, and so I really feel that when we say this course is for everyone, that's because the skills that we give you can be applied in virtually any context. Yeah, so maybe if I can just to pick up on one bit of that, just to go back and forwards. Um, it, it's not that we're trying to say, you know, here's a problem you're working on or a creative process you're involved with, and here's exactly the tool you should use, just go away and use it. All the way through, we're emphasizing how do these tools actually work? So, you know, what, is, what does creative work actually require? How do the tools fit within the within those requirements and therefore you can go away understanding what tools will achieve what things how you might modify the tools for the particular situations you're working on and have the confidence not just to pick up the tools that we give you or tools you might find elsewhere but to start modifying those tools and inventing other approaches and putting them together and it's certainly one of the gratifying things to have seen in the first course run that by the end of the course the students were using the creative process and the creative tools that we'd uh, discussed with them and were applying them back on themselves and modifying those creative tools and saying how they would change them for their particular context of work. So it's not just a sort of um, one size fits all uh, recipe that you go away and uh, do. You can, you can use it that way if you want, but there's lots of opportunities to understand much more deeply what's going on in creative work and therefore how you can uh, adapt the tools as you go along.
I think we've lost Seth for just a minute. So um, Nathan, can you share a bit more about some of the feedback you saw from the students and some of the change and growth that you saw from students within the, the first course run that just finished up? Yeah, sure. Um, so maybe an example to focus on, just because it's quite well understood, is brainstorming. So I expect many of you on the call have heard about brainstorming or practiced it. Um, and I don't want to suggest that the course we run is just brainstorming, but it's one of the things that's in there. And often the learners we've got have previously done some brainstorming. They might have had some coaching on the brainstorming method. Um, but the way that we run it, um, which is a very, the whole course is very research driven. So there's research um, that indicates how you would structure a course like this. There's research about how the different tools and methods work. Um, and some of that's based on the research that I've done here in Cambridge with my research group. So it's very research driven and therefore uh, when we implement something like brainstorming, it's based on brainstorming research. So how do you, how, what sort of rules do you have in play when you're undertaking brainstorming activities? What are the objectives that you've got? How should you structure the interactions you have with people by themselves or people working in a group? How do you conduct brainstorming when it's face-to-face -face versus when it's uh, online, whether that's synchronous or asynchronous? Um, and we use various digital tools to support that as well. So we've seen learners who have been trained in brainstorming but haven't necessarily applied it in the way that we advocate on the course. And then they come away with clear objectives as to how they will run their brainstorming sessions in future, or if they were participating in a brainstorming session, what tools they would bring uh, to the table for that. So we've seen that sort of thing where there's a specific tool that the learner has picked up and they now have much more confidence in uh, using that in future and see the benefits of doing so. We've seen on the individual long projects that we've referred to, uh, learners who've been working on something that's a real problem in their environment, and they come away at, at the end of the six weeks having systematically worked through challenging the problem, reframing it, looking at it from different perspectives, identifying other stakeholders in the problem that they hadn't identified initially, uh, making progress during those six weeks and get, being further along with their actual work um, because of what we've been running through in the course. Um, and as we've emphasized uh, a few times, it's not just that you're going through this course individually, there's a cohort experience because you're with these uh, different learners from different backgrounds and different countries. And so often there's this sharing of experience. So people might have um, done a certain type, let's just refer back to brainstorming. They might have tried certain things in brainstorming and found a particular technique to be effective. They might share experiences on when brainstorming sessions have broken down and become ineffective. They might all have different experiences of uh, organizational culture and the effect that has on the promotion or the inhibition of creative work. So clearly we provide a lot of material in terms of the course content, but the learners are also really learning from each other and the diversity of the cohort uh, really helps with that. So in having a course that's broadly available to a wide range of people, different backgrounds, different educational uh, orientations, etc. That means that diversity is relevant to the work you can undertake in your groups during the course itself. So that's just some of the, the developments, developments we've seen. Um, and with the learners very, uh, like very satisfied, really enjoying the engagement that they get to um, have with each other and with the course material and to see that progress from week to week. It's not that you're doing the same thing for six weeks. Each week we're moving on to a different aspect of creativity or the creative process um, as we get through the six modules. Nathan, a question just came in about uh, whether creativity is a talent or a skill, and I have some very strong feelings about this, but I'll, I'll let you go first. <laughs> okay, yeah, um, that's a great question, and I think maybe the, I suppose the way I personally approach this is that although it's useful to refer to creativity as a general subject matter so that you can distinguish it from other subjects, let's say as compared to management. What's often really helpful is to recognize what word you would pair up with, cre with creative. So are you talking about creative ability, creative attainment, creative confidence, um, creative skills, creative processes? There's lots of different creative things. And one of the things we do in the, uh, in the course is break creativity down into all those different elements so it isn't just one thing. So there is definitely innate creative orientation. Some people are inclined to engage with creative work more than others. That typically involves them uh, tolerating high levels of ambiguity. You know, rather than just closing down a problem straight away or closing down a solution, they're able to entertain that ambiguity for longer and remain comfortable or even enjoy that, um, 
that openness. Uh, so that's one aspect of what you might think of creative talent is partly it's just orientation or inclination. Then aside from orientation, um, then you might have people who naturally, without any provocation, exhibit, let's say, high levels of divergent thinking. So they can think of lots of different answers to a question, not just one. And then you can have creative skill, which is something that can be developed through training. And you can, whatever your level of orientation, whatever your level of uh, innate skill, you can then develop that further by learning certain techniques and by applying those. So one of the things we spend some time on in the course is analogical thinking or analogy mapping, where you, you recognize that the problem you're working on is in some way analogous to some other problem, and you explore how that other problem is dealt with, you imagine how you would solve that other problem, and then you can apply that back to the original problem you're thinking about. So that might be something that someone innately does because they're highly skilled creatively without any training, but you can also very rapidly accelerate someone's creative abilities, which looks like creative skill, uh, by giving them some of those tools and the ability to move systematically between them. Uh, so that, that's some, some of my approach to that question. But yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, Emily, do you want to share your views? Um, well, as, as a person who, uh, who used to, to work in, in the music world, um, I hear a lot about talent and I'm firmly of the belief that, that there is, is kind of, as you said, no such thing as uh, innate talent. There's simply inclination towards certain um, situations which may allow you to acquire skills faster than other people who have not had the opportunity to be within those situations. Um, and so from my point of view, uh, everything that um, everything that you hear about in terms of creativity is something that we can we can give you um, on this course. And I, I think Nathan's kind of uh, mentioned it, but again, one of the things that's really special on this course is that we spend time examining how to think and how to build creativity into your thinking process and how to be more open to ideas and how to measure your idea of flexibility and fluency and uh, and improve that. Um, so it's not a matter of uh, being good at it or not being good at it. Uh, it's very much sort of a growth opportunity. Um, and I think I think with that, I'm getting the signal that we're we're meant to be wrapping this up. Um, So I think uh, if if our host could put the um, okay, I have a message to relay. And apologies again that we've lost Seth and for the technical challenges here at the end. Um, but we want to thank all of you for joining us today. We hope you've enjoyed learning about creativity, problem solving, and design thinking. And if you didn't get your question answered, then we will try to get back to you with a specific answer uh, very soon. Um, there will be a short survey coming to you. Uh, when you exit the webinar, and we'd appreciate it if uh, you fill out that survey and then ask any further questions you haven't had a chance to ask um, and give us some feedback uh, within that survey. And then you'll get a follow up email later this week uh, with the recording of this webinar and some of the useful links, including I saw there was a question about the email address, and we'll make sure that you receive that as part of the follow up email. Yeah, and just from me, thanks everyone for the interest and the uh, questions, and maybe I'll see some of you in the future. Thanks a lot.